When Whitlam took office in 1972, I don't think even he expected what was to come. From ambitious plans to a hostile Senate to a worldwide energy crisis, the next few years were going to be very interesting. In 1972, Gough Whitlam had become a Labour Party legend, ending two decades of coalition rule and becoming the 21st Prime Minister of Australia. After initially running the entire country with his deputy Lance Barnard, Whitlam would form a proper ministry with all 27 ministers and much greater autonomy from the Labour executive than any previous Labour government. And with his new team accounted for, he would immediately get to work enacting his political agenda. Straight from the get-go, Whitlam would end Australia's conscription policy and would pardon all incarcerated draft dodgers, ending 73 years of mandatory service. He would also recognise the People's Republic of China, today Australia's largest trading partner, as well as remove the last remaining forces out of South Vietnam, which would fall to North Vietnam a few years later. Outside of military policy, Whitlam was passionate about social justice and would appoint former Labour leader H.V. Evatt's niece, Elizabeth Evatt, to the Commonwealth Council of Arbitration Commission to look into gaining women equal pay for equal work, as well as joining an international ban on the sports teams from the apartheid-run states of South Africa and Rhodesia from playing games in Australia. He would also fulfil his campaign promise to abolish university fees, as well as abolishing the death penalty, moving all death row inmates over to life sentences. Keeping up? Good, because we still have more to cover. In 1973, Whitlam decided Australia needed its own national anthem to reflect its own national identity. Previously, Australia had used the UK's anthem of God Save the Queen. Multiple entries would be submitted, but ultimately the 1878 song Advance Australia Fair would prove to be the most popular, and so would begin a long decade's fight between the old and new anthem, which would eventually be resolved in 1984 under Bob Hawke, who would make Advance Australia Fair the official anthem, and God Save the Queen the royal anthem, to be used at events where a member of the British royal family is present. And today you get the pleasure of listening to it every time you watch one of my videos. However, Whitlam was doing too much. After 23 years in opposition, the Labour Party had begun to see Australia as too complicit and had become all too engrossed in progressing Australia into a modern country as fast as possible. This resulted in a conservative backlash the likes that had never been seen before in Australian history, with a whopping 74% of people in one poll expressing that the government was doing too much. Along with this, Whitlam found himself in increasing odds with the non-Labour Eastern State governments, especially the Queensland Coalition Government under Country Party leader Joe Bielecki Peterson over the Queensland-owned Torres Strait Islands of Boingu and Sabai, which Whitlam had planned to give over to the soon-to-be independent territory of Papua New Guinea. All three of these governments would soon be re-elected with increased margins, showing a strong rejection of Whitlam's federal policies, and with this, the federal Liberal opposition took its chance to strike. After McMahon had stepped down, the leadership of the Liberal Party would go over to Billy Mackey Snedden. Despite originating from a working class family of Labour voters, Snedden would become a passionate Liberal supporter and later politician in 1955, where he would narrowly retain his seat of Bruce in the nail biting 1961 election to now become leader of the Liberal Party. With help from the country and Democratic Labour parties in the Senate, Snedden would be successful in curtailing Whitlam's agenda and as polls continued to show a public opposed to Whitlam's ambitious policies, he began to use the Senate to block more and more of the Labour Party's bills. Whitlam knew that the biggest threat to the Labour Party was not the coalition, but the Democratic Labour Party. Despite originally forming to combat the communist elements of the Labour Party, the DLP now only seemed to exist despite the Labour Party. Despite failing to keep Labour in opposition, the DLP was not about to give up and were all too keen to send the Labour Party back into opposition. Whitlam knew that if Labour hoped to have a fair shot at winning future elections, the DLP needed to go. His target would be their popular senator and former Queensland Premier Vince Gare. Whitlam knew the Irish Catholic senator was keen on a diplomatic position after having to resign as party leader due to disagreements with the four other senators. Whitlam would appoint Gare to be Australia's ambassador to Ireland. This was done for two reasons. The first was to open up an extra Senate vacancy for the upcoming election which Labour could theoretically win, and the second was to get Gare away from Canberra, depriving the DLP of a popular figurehead. This move caused a massive backlash not only from the DLP, who expelled Gare, but also the Conservative parties who knew Whitlam was trying to open up more Senate seats so he could win the Senate in the upcoming election. The Queensland Government would be successful in preventing the extra seat going up for re-election, and in Canberra the Senate blocked Whitlam's supply bill forcing him into a double dissolution election on the 18th of May, which would finally see a House and Senate election happen on the same day after 10 years. Now, the government you elected for three years has been interrupted in mid-career. 
our program has been brought to a halt in midstream. Everything we promised, everything we've achieved, everything you expected of us, all this is suddenly threatened. It's threatened by the actions of the men you rejected a mere 17 months ago. The choice is clear and the choice is sharp. Will we allow inflationary socialism to eat out the heart of Australia? This election would also see the seat tally taken up to 127, as well as the voting age reduced from 21 to 18 years of age. And the winner was... To Snedden's surprise, Whitlam had won with 51.7% of the two party preferred, and a net loss of only one seat, to now hold 66. This was likely due to Whitlam's incredible campaign skills, with slogans like, Oh no, not Snedden, and Give Goff a fair go, which portrayed the Liberals as obstructionist politicians with no agenda other than to oppose Labour. Snedden had picked up three seats, thanks to the increased seat count to now hold 61, with 48.3% of the two party preferred. But his inability to concede defeat, claiming, while we didn't win, we didn't lose at all, exposed him to mass criticism and led to calls for him to step down as leader, despite a somewhat positive result for his party. Meanwhile, the biggest loser of this election would be the DLP, who after facing a massive 7.55% swing against them in the Senate, would lose all five Senate seats, eliminating them from Canberra, and with Gare off to Dublin, the party would fall apart and would eventually dissolve four years later. The party that had so long been a thorn in Labour's side, preventing them from winning elections for over a decade, was finally gone, and with it the playing field in Canberra would be even once again. However, during its tenure, the DLP would show the effectiveness of a third party in the Senate to moderate the two main parties, and new parties would begin to form, hoping to emulate this power. Willem had successfully become the first Labour Prime Minister to win two elections in a row, as well as eliminate his arch-rivals in the DLP. However, he had failed to gain control of the Senate, and this would prove to be very consequential very soon. Come back next time for part one of the election of 1975.